Welcome everyone to the December annual meeting of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society. Of course, this will feel very much like a general meeting. So for the second year in a row, we will not have any kind of holiday party or dinner party like we were supposed to have this year. Uh, so we'll kind of feel like a general meeting tonight, but what makes it the annual meeting is we do have to have final nominations and elections for officers, but we may have to do the elections uh, by email because we do have uh, competing positions here and there for uh, members at large and maybe some officers, but we'll find out later. So. One thing we didn't do um, this past January is kind of a new tradition I've tried to start called Astronomy Open House. So earlier this year, you know, I tried to take advantage of the Zoom meetings and have speakers we normally could never get, and I'm going to continue that into the new year. And so I postponed it and figured since we couldn't do the uh, standard dinner party this year, we would do astronomy open house for the December meeting. So that's what we're going to do tonight. And I really like to do meetings like this because it kind of goes back to the tradition of, you know, the early days of the Kalamazoo Amateur Astronomical Association, when, you know, members prim primarily met in their homes and members pretty much always gave the feature presentations. Although if you really look back, they did have people from K College and Western Michigan College, as it was known at the time, uh, give guest, guest talks as well. So, but it was mostly members, you know, sharing their knowledge with other members, which of course is really what a, a group like ours is, is all about. And we do have a couple meetings that, that do this every year. Of course, we have gadget night, which we're kind of we're going to move to the picnic from now on. I don't think we're going to do a July meeting anymore, uh, but we'll do gadget night to the picnic. So so members can share their gadgets uh, that they build or bought with one another. And we'll continue that tradition because we've been doing that since the 50s. And of course, we'll uh, continue doing astrophotography night every October where members share their astro photos. But of course, those are very specific. Um, you know, you got to share gadgets during gadget night. You got to share astro photos during astro photo night. How about something more general where we can share a whole bunch of knowledges or experiences and stuff like that? And so that's the uh, uh, gist of the idea of Astronomy Open House. And so tonight we have a pretty eclectic collection of presentations. Um, we have uh, uh, in the main event tonight, we have uh, Pete Mumbauer, who's gonna talk about his trip to Mauna Kea. David Parks is gonna talk about electronically assisted astronomy. And then I shortly here will give a presentation on the HR diagram. So we have a little bit of science, a little bit of the hobby and a little bit of uh, astronomical travel. So without further ado, Let's just go ahead and jump right into it. So uh, give me just a second here and I will share my screen if I can find the proper screen. And as many of you know, I've given um, quite a few presentations for the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society in my day. And some of my presentations have been you know, over a hundred slides. And I've been planning on doing this for a while, but I didn't plan on doing it tonight, but I couldn't find another volunteer. So tonight's presentation, believe it or not, you'll probably pass out in your chair, has one slide and this is it. So as you can see, I'm gonna talk about what's called the Hertzsprung Russell Diagram. If you're one of my uh, present or past students, you've heard this before. Uh, so this will be a review for you. So the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, or as we always call it for short, the HR diagram, was created independently by Enar Hertzsprung and Henry Norris Russell in the early 20th century. In fact, uh, the first published uh, version was by Hertzsprung in 1911. And then Russell made a bit alternate version in 1913. So it was basically made, you know, in the 1910s or so. And of course, you might wonder, why is the HR diagram so important? So 
as you can see from the slide here, it's basically a graph. It's a graph that separates the effects of temperature and surface area on stellar luminosities. And more importantly than that, it enables us to sort stars according to their diameters, and at least for one part of the diagram, their mass. And this really helped astronomers in the early 20th century understand the evolution of stars for the first time. So that's why it's so important, because in the early 20th century, they kind of put planetary astronomy aside. Cosmology and the study of galaxies didn't quite come along yet. So it was all about stellar evolution in the early 20th century. So let's spend the bulk of our time examining the HR diagram in detail. And we'll start with the x-axis of our you know, uh, basic scatter plot here. And on the x-axis, we always have uh, a surface temperature. Well, I shouldn't say always, but here, here in this case, we have surface temperature. And you can see it expressed by either the temperatures in, in Kelvin, like for example, the, the sun has a surface temperature of 5,800 Kelvin, which is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, or it can be expressed in terms of spectral classification. And so the spectral classification uh, that we see here, O, B, A, F, G, K, M, was organized by Annie Jump Cannon, one of uh, uh, Pickering's uh, uh, computers in the early 20th century. You know, he had this group of women that did routine measurements and calculations for him. There's a whole different story behind that. And we've had speakers talk about that before. But then uh, the, ver the version that we use today, which is very similar, is called the Morgan Keenan classification. And that basically adds a luminosity class after the spectral type. So it's not a whole lot different from what Annie Jump Cannon uh, developed or you know, reorganized uh, back in early 20th century. So you can see we have, uh, again, the temperature in Kelvin, but I'll, I'll mainly focus on the spectral type here. So of course we have the type O stars, which are the hottest. They're usually in excess of 30,000 Kelvin. Again, the sun is 5,800 Kelvin, and they tend to have a blue color, as you can kind of tell from the colors on the diagram here. And uh, they're, they're very rare, only about uh, uh, 0 0.0 zero 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 three percent of all stars within the sun's neighborhood anyway are o-type stars so they are very rare uh, because not every cluster makes them and not and they don't last very long you know they have very short lives because they're so massive they're in excess of 16 times the mass of the sun and and so so they burn through their fuel very quickly and then we have the B-type stars, and uh, those can be deep blue to white, and they range between 10 to uh, 30,000 Kelvin. A-type stars uh, can be between 75 and 10,000 Kelvin, and they're, they range from blue to white. You can kind of see they segue into white, while F-type stars are white, and they're between 6,000 to 7,500 Kelvin. And then we have the G-type stars, which of course includes the sun, and they can be between 5,200 and 6,000 Kelvin, and they can be yellowish white, because you may have heard like past speakers like the astronaut story Musgrave, you know, he, he's seen the sun from space, and of course, if you see it from space, it looks white. It doesn't look yellow like it does to us on the surface of Earth. And then we have uh, kind of lower or cooler stars like the K-type stars, and those are between 3,700 and 5,200 Kelvin, and they can range from kind of a pale yellow to orange. And then we have the M-type stars, which can be, you know, mainly red dwarfs for this part of the diagram that I'll talk about. And those can range from uh, light orange to red, and they range in temperature, I don't think I mentioned it, from 2,400 to 37 Kelvin. And they are crazy common, at least for the small ones. But I'll, 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 I'll come back to that. So then on the y-axis, uh, it can be expressed uh, two normal ways. The, the one shown here is the most common, where we have luminosity. So uh, let me explain that. So luminosity uh, really means 
how much any energy per second uh, a, a star emits. And there are two factors that determine a star's luminosity. There's surface area and temperature. But surface area is by far the most important because the more surface area a star has, the more area it has to emit energy. So that's why it, it, it's so much more important. You know, you, you can have a red supergiant and a red dwarf with the exact same temperature, but a red supergiant will be considerably more luminous and brighter because it's bigger. So, so that's pretty cut and dry, but temperature can be important. So if you have a slightly smaller star that's a lot hotter than a bigger star, then odds are the slightly smaller, hotter star will be more luminous. So, so temperature can be important, but usually uh, surface area is the dominating factor. That's the really important one. And so there are, um, oh, so for example, uh, the luminosity of the sun is in, in kind of a weird type of unit. It's uh, approximately four times 10 to the 26 you know, a, a four followed by 26 zeros, joules per second. And that's where you usually lose people. But kind of a general comparison is one joule per second is equivalent to about one watt, you know, like a one watt light bulb, which wouldn't be very handy, but imagine, you know, a, a 60 watt light bulb, but imagine four times 10 to the 26 watt light bulb. So that's a lot of watts. But to, to, to make the uh, luminosity uh, scale here uh, more relatable, it's done in, uh, in ratio with the sun. So, you know, if you divide the luminosity of the sun by itself, it has a luminosity of one. So these are, this is the luminosity in solar units. And there are luminosity classes that are done in Roman numerals. And basically the smaller the Roman numeral, uh, the more luminous it is. So we have like Roman numeral uh, 1A, which are bright supergiants like way up here. And then we have Roman numeral 1Bs, which are just, you know, your run, run of the mill supergiants. Roman numeral 2s are bright giants. Roman numeral 3s are giants. Roman numeral 4s are subgiants, which are aren't quite around the giant phase yet, kind of a border between here somewhere. And then uh, Roman numeral fives are what we call the main sequence, which is the most important part of the diagram that I'll uh, spend some time talking about as well. But sometimes you can interchange luminosity with absol or not, uh, yeah, absolute magnitude. So you may have heard of apparent magnitude. You know, that's how bright stars appear in our sky above Earth. But absolute magnitude is basically the apparent visual star, uh, the, the apparent visual magnitude all stars would have if they were 10 parsecs away. So if you could magically place all 10 parsecs, you know, all stars 10 parsecs away, it'd be easy to compare which one was brighter with the next. So it's a, you know, a kind of a hypothetical scale, but it's like the true brightness of stars. You know, for, for, for an example, the sun has an absolute magnitude of about five plus five, which is the brightness of the dimmest stars in the Little Dipper. So, 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 so there you go. And then you can see we have these lines here kind of crisscrossing from upper left to lower right. And of course, these can plot the stars by solar radii, you know, and, and units compared with the sun. So of course, you don't really see any small stars down here. There are stars that are very small, but they're way off the diagram here, like neutron stars, which are really stellar remnants. That's That goes with white dwarves as well. Uh, but basically, as you go from the uh, lower left to the upper right, you know, stars get bigger. So, so you get a sense of their uh, size here. But uh, the, the stars uh, shown here for an example are not shown to scale because supergiants are far larger than the giants uh, uh, shown here. So yeah, they, they, are, they are definitely not to scale. But of course, as mentioned, the most important part of the HR diagram is the main sequence, which runs from the uh, lower right to the upper left.
And the reason why the main sequence is so important is because this is where sp stars spend 90% of their lifetime fusing hydrogen into helium. So, of course, that's what the sun is doing right now. So the sun is a G25 star. So that means it has a you know temperature of 5,800 Kelvin because, uh, as I didn't mention, each spectral type has a subdivision between 0 and 9, although there's no such thing as an O0 O or O1 or O2 star that I know of. Uh, I, I think there's O3s, but uh, nothing more massive or hotter than that. So, so the sun is G2V, which means it's uh, 5,800 Kelvin, and it's a main sequence star, so that's why we find it on the main sequence. And when you divide it by itself, it has a luminosity of one. So that's where we find the sun on the main sequence. And the really cool thing about the main sequence when you know stars are kind of in their prime here is this is where you can sort them by mass, or, or they basically sort themselves by mass. So we have the lowest mass stars down here, the red dwarfs, which are by far the most common type of star. Of all the stars in our solar neighborhood, roughly maybe like a thousand light year radius, uh, over 76% of all stars near us are red dwarfs. So they're very likely the most common type of star in the entire universe. In, in fact, all these red dwarfs shown here are amongst the nearest stars and none are visible to the naked eye, in, including Proxima Centauri here, which is, you know, like 4.2 light years away. I mean, it's really close. It's the closest star to the sun and you can't see it with the naked eye. And of course, if you're a Star Trek The Next Generation fan, you know uh, Wolf 359 because that's where Starfleet got their butts uh, handed to them by the Borg. And uh, Barnard Star, is a high proper motion star. And you see, uh, we kind of segue into K-type stars here. 61 uh, Cygni A and B, these are the first stars to have their distances measured by uh, the parallax method, basically a form of triangulation. And you can see many other famous stars. I won't bother to go through them all. You know, we have many of the winter stars now coming into view, like uh, Procyon here or uh, Sirius, but we have summer stars too, like Vega and Altair. So, so we have stars all up and down the main sequence here. And again, it's so important because this is where they spend 90% of their lifetime. But eventually, um, stars with masses between roughly 0.4 solar masses and maybe upwards of seven times the mass of the sun, they'll eventually become giants. They'll basically stop fusing hydrogen into helium and eventually they'll fuse helium into carbon in their core and then hydrogen in a shell above the core and that's when they become giant stars like this. So this will be the ultimate fate of the sun. And basically as stars uh, expand, you know, of course, as they expand, they get bigger. That's what it means to expand. And they increase in luminosity, but uh, the energy needed to uplift the gas and make it a giant makes them cool off. So they actually go kind of to the upper right here. And this is kind of what you call the horizontal branch of the HR diagram, but it doesn't look very horizontal here. And then the most massive stars, basically eight solar masses and above, uh, they'll become super giants and uh, most will probably go supernova. So, so th they will blow up. And that's going to be the ultimate fate of Betelgeuse and Antares for sure. And definitely Denim too. Denim's one of the nearest, um, well, not the nearest, but it's a you know, really big super giant. It's actually the most distant of the super giants, but it's really bright in the sky. So it's, it's, pretty powerful. But the giant stars will, you know, shed their outer layers, become planetary nebulae, and the core will collapse and become white dwarfs. So white dwarfs are kind of the exposed cores of um, medium mass stars that, you know, have expelled their outer layers and the core has collapsed. And, you know, the typical white dwarf will be composed of carbon oxygen um, 
nuclei with degenerate electrons and they no longer produce uh, nuclear fusion, they just basically cool off over time. So they might start off really, really blue, but they give away their energy into space and kind of can become yellow. I think the coolest red dwarfs known are actually uh, red, like around 3000 Kelvin. Eventually, they'll cool off entirely and become black dwarves, but the universe isn't old enough uh, for white dwarves to have fully cooled off yet. And of course, uh, we have Sirius B here, which was the first white dwarf discovered, and it has up almost the exact same mass as the sun, about uh, just a bit about 2% less massive than the sun, but it has a temperature over 25,000 Kelvin. And its diameter is roughly equal to Earth, but because it's, you know, so small, you know, the size of Earth, that means its luminosity is low. So that's why we find white dwarfs um, down here, because, yeah, they're very hot, but they're very small, so they have no luminosity. And they're very dense. Uh, they typically have a density, or at least Sirius B does, of 3 million grams per cubic centimeter, or 3 million times the density of water. And if you could do it, if you could bring back a teaspoonful of Sirius B material, it would weigh more than 15 tons. Uh, but of course, you couldn't do that because what keeps it so dense and then, uh, massive is the gravity of the entire star. Now, one last thing I want to mention is there is an alternate version of the HR diagram called a color magnitude diagram. And this is where you replace the temperature with the color as seen through uh, blue and visual filters. Because of course, everyone sees colors differently. So it's better to measure it with telescopes, with proper filters, and then do that. So, so you can replace this with uh, color, you know, because color and temperature are really interchangeable, as you kind of get a sense of from the pretty colors here. And then you can replace um, luminosity or even absolute magnitude with apparent magnitude. But you can only do this with star clusters, you know, specifically open clusters, because open clusters have some pretty amazing properties. You know, they're all roughly the same distance. So you don't need an absolute magnitude scale. You, you figure the apparent magnitudes are pretty much equivalent to the absolute magnitudes since, you know, again, they're all the same distance. We know open cluster stars should all form at the, roughly the same time. And we know they have the same, you know, chemical composition. But what will be different is their mass. So if we uh, plot stars from one open cluster on an HR diagram, uh, it can reveal something called the turnoff point, at least for a bit older clusters. You know, of course, these are all random stars across the sky, but let's say uh, there's no O's and B's and A's. Let's say they kind of end around the F's. So we would say the turnoff point is here. You know, we, we have stars on the main sequence here, but nowhere else. That means the cluster has outlived um, or the, the stars that were, that were more massive in that cluster have died. So the turnoff point reveals the age of the cluster. So this helps us confirm our, you know, our mathematical models of how stars age. And it, it's really helped us uh, lead, you know, helped us uh, discover and confirm ideas of stellar evolution. So I could spend, you know, an entire our lecture talking about this, or uh, as I even you know done research over the years, I've realized I could put a whole course together talking about nothing but the HR diagram. But I just wanted to give you a uh, brief introduction to the most important diagram in all of astronomy. All right, so there's uh, my presentation. But before we jump into the next one, our uh, Alcor, uh, Aaron Roman wanted to speak on something real quick that relates to my presentation. So uh, Aaron, go ahead and take it away. All right, um, I'm gonna try sharing my screen. All right, what are you guys seeing? It looks Desk. like we're seeing your desktop. Yep, your desktop. 
desktop. Did I move it to the wrong side? I got two screens. How's that? It's uh, astronomical league. Uh, but there we go. Okay. All right. So um, I know I've walked a couple of people through this, um, but this is the astronomical league's homepage, uh, and where. Uh, if you're interested in doing the observing programs, you may spend a lot of your time. You want to come over to this observe uh, drop down, and I like looking at them. There's a bunch of different ways to look at them, from equipment needed, experience level, and um, observing programs listed alphabetically. I'm going to go with that alphabetical for now. Uh, and what you see is a whole bunch of uh, programs listed alphabetically with their images next to them and their name, um, specific to this. Uh, Richard's presentation, um, you may want to come down here and look at this Stellar Evolution Observing Program. Uh, I started this one myself um, sometime last year, and I haven't continued with it, but uh, it's one of the easiest to accomplish because of the objects on it. None of them are difficult to find. Um, they're all your brightest stars um, that you probably know if you've been doing any observing at all by heart. Uh, so there's nothing complicated to find here. But what the uh, presenter wanted to put together was this manual and a way to teach you about what we're looking at in the sky. And uh, this particular presentation is one of the simplest and most direct and most comprehensive for a beginner uh, explanations I've ever read. Um, and so you can see they do go into the HR diagram uh, and they talk about uh, both uh, open clusters and, and stellar birth and neb nebula. Um, they do go through the different colors uh, in some detail, a lot of history. Uh, they've got the breakdown on the um, star layers uh, that you may be looking for. How you travel through the uh, the HR diagram in a star's life, it meanders out, it meanders back in, comes back out, and then crashes down eventually into your white dwarves. Um, but it's got a really good explanation of everything that Richard just went through briefly. Uh, but you can take your time with it and um, and it's really, I understood it a hundred times better after reading this, uh, not once, but three times. Um, I really enjoyed it. And uh, I've shared it a couple of times with uh, even non-astronomy people just to be like, here, if you want to understand stars, read this. Um, but again, it's at the bottom of the, uh, let me see if this, okay. If you go all the way to the bottom of the Stellar Evolution page, which isn't very far, it's a, it's a PDF um, right there. And if you want to see the observing list, um, it is 100 objects like a lot of them are. Um, but it'll give you a good opportunity to start with things like the Pleiades, you know, which is out right now and bright enough you can see through a cloudy night. Um, but it's asking you to observe it and talk about it in specifically in its uh, the context of its stellar evolution. So it's a good program, I think. Um, I haven't done it yet, but I'd love to hear more people, but it's not, it's definitely one of those ones if you just wanna learn, uh, this is a great place to start. And one of the things that he says right away is any of your past observations do not count for observations during this program because he specifically wants you to make those observations with that manual in hand learning the HR diagram, stellar evolution, while you're making that observation. And so um, it's something worth looking at. That's about all I got. If anybody's got any questions, feel free to ask, either shoot me uh, an email or post in the text or the chat. All right, thank you, Aaron. Uh, so does anyone have any questions about the HR diagram or? stars in general before we move on? I actually had a question. I don't sure, understand I how a star goes from uh, a red giant and then collapses down and heats up as it goes to a white dwarf. Why does it heat up so much? 
Oh, oh you mean the, the collapse core? Right. Uh, basically, it, it's it's a simple matter of pressure, you know, okay. um, because uh, you know gravity spends pretty much the entire star's lives tr trying to crush it to a smaller and smaller size, you know, denser and denser size. But it, it's the um, it's the fusion generated in the core that you know, gushes out energy that, that balances the force of gravity. It's, it's what they call hydrostatic equilibrium. So, of course, gravity is always going to be there as long as you have mass, but the star is not always going to have fuel to burn because, you know, it, going from hydrogen to helium or, you know, from helium to uh, carbon re requires a core temperature of 100 million Kelvin. And that's where the sun's going to quit. So, so once the sun burns all of its uh, uh, helium that it's making today into carbon, that's when the core is going to begin to collapse and just basically heat up through pressure. And then, the, you know, the, the outer layers will, you know, gradually implode, you know, and rebound and shut off their layers and become the planetary nebulae. And the core just gets as dense as it can and gets just hot through pressure but eventually that 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 will that heat will be relieved in the space and then, then it'll just be a black door but again that won't happen for a long time so yeah it's, it's just pressure okay thank you yep i have a question sure what is a carbon star it's uh, uh basically a, a star with a uh, a carbon rich atmosphere that's the really short answer so they're they're often prized to look at because you know they're they're very red. And that's it. It's just I mean we haven't talked about them in in the course that you did. No, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, that's one of the few things I don't cover. I can't cover <laughs> everything, but yeah, that that's the really short version of what of of what a carbon star is. It just has a very rich carbon atmosphere. Okay. A lot Thank of soot, a lot, lot of soot in the atmosphere. All right, so uh, next up, we have uh, David Parks. Uh, this, at, during the, this meeting last year, he proposed uh, giving a talk on tonight's subject. And so it took us a year to take him up on it. So uh, David, go ahead and tell us about electronically assisted astronomy. Uh, certainly, thank you. Let's see if I can uh, share my screen. Yeah, hopefully you you can see my screen all right. Yep. All right. Well, then, uh, thank you. We'll get started. Uh, welcome to the EAA Basics presentation uh, that I've prepared for the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society. Uh, for those who, who don't know, my name is David Parks, and I'm delighted to share uh, with you some thoughts about the practice of EAA and uh, how it might be beneficial and uh, what types of hardware and software are typically used. Now, the images that you're gonna see in these slides uh, in this presentation are all examples of EAA. Um, and I'd like to think, uh, when you see those, I'd like you to think about them and, and compare them to what you would typically see in an eyepiece rather than uh, what astrophotography might produce. So electronically assisted astronomy typically has a very broad definition that allows a wide range of equipment and techniques to be used. However, it generally means that you are using some form of electronic equipment to enhance observation in real or near real time. Meaning you would generally use whatever technology you've chosen to capture relatively short images, short exposure images, uh, over a relatively short integration time. Anywhere from 10 to 30 seconds uh, might be your typical EAA exposure time and often only viewed uh, for five or 10 minutes in order to appreciate details that you would not observe visually alone. Uh, this is usually plenty of time to generate a satisfying image 
while still keeping the experience more akin to observing rather than imaging. While uh, 10 to 30 seconds might be typical, there is nothing preventing you from using longer exposures, uh, one to five minutes, or from integrating for a longer period of time, aside from the limitations of your mouth, uh, light pollu uh, pollution and other factors. Of course, longer time spent either in exposure or integration may shift the experience more towards imaging rather than observing. One of the reasons the definition of EAA is so broad is that you can tailor your experience to fit your equipment, your sky conditions, and your observational preferences so that you settle upon your own definition of how EAA works for you. We can use EAA techniques to overcome many of the challenges that can make visual observation difficult or less satisfying. Maybe we live in an urban area that suffers from light pollution uh, caused by street lamps or other outdoor lighting. Maybe we have vision problems or wear glasses and find it difficult to use eyepieces. Or maybe we just wanna see more than the faint fuzzy cotton ball we've all seen so many times in an eyepiece. EAA allows us to view in near real time an image that reveals fainter objects than what we could observe visually, including extended objects and structural details using modest equipment and often in not, very, at the, not the very best conditions. In short, EAA allows us to see more with less. Because our goal in EAA is not to produce the astrophoto of the day, there is no post-processing associated or practice with EAA. Many live stacking programs allow the use of calibration frames, uh, masters such as darks, flats, and bias, uh, but this is considered pre-processing. These are optional and if used, can help produce a calibrated stacked image in near real time. However, the post-processing techniques associated with astrophotography are not done with EAA. EAA is more about the experience of viewing a near real time image rather than producing a photo to save and share. However, EAA can be a gateway or part of the process for astrophotography. Many people save their EAA images for later post-processing into astrophotos. Uh, in this case, one discipline easily flows into another. Any type of mount can be used, even manual mounts and photo tripods. However, you can enjoy whatever additional features your mount offers. A manual mount may only allow an exposure of two to five seconds before distortion from star trails occur. A motorized tracking mount might allow 30 to 60 seconds, maybe more, all depending on the quality of the mount. Alt-as mounts are often used, which are perfectly capable of obtaining the short exposures associated with EAA before field rotation will trail the stars. EAA can be practiced with almost any level of equipment or from any level of budget from photo tripods and star trackers to premium and guided equatorial mounts. People often meet the minimal requirements by simply using what they already have. Short exposure live stacking greatly reduces the requirements of the mount and allows one to see details in much lighter and smaller aperture telescopes than what is accustomed in visual astronomy. It is still true that larger aperture will collect more light and resolve finer details. However, by using a camera and software to stack short exposures, you will be able to see more details even in a small aperture than you would visually using a much larger aperture. When comparing the view through a small and large aperture, of course, the large aperture will show more. However, 
we are here comparing near real time imaging to traditional eyepiece viewing. This is where we realize we can see more and enjoy the benefits of a small, lightweight EAA setup versus a larger, heavier visual system. You can use large systems, of course, but the point here is that you can even use modest systems to achieve great results. Personally, I find it very satisfying to look outside to find the sky is clear, and then without any prior planning, to easily carry the fully set up equipment outdoors and then retire indoors with my wife to our easy chairs while directing the telescope remotely to center one object after another for viewing on my tablet screen. Using AAA, we not only see more, but we can realize and take advantage of the many benefits that come with using smaller, lighter, more portable equipment. Of course, you will need a telescope, mount, and some type of camera. While a video camera, such as the Revolution Imager, will only require power and a viewing screen, more often dedicated CMOS astronomy cameras are used with a computer and software to live stack and view images. Using a computer also allows us to simultaneously control the mount and other equipment we may have. If you choose to use a PC, laptop, or other Microsoft Windows-based computer, then you'll find SharpCap is the most recommended software for live stacking and other features useful for EAA. ASI Studio is another popular software suite used with ZWO cameras capable of live stacking. There are uh, Raspberry Pi-based solutions, which is a small pocket-sized computer that you would connect to remotely using a laptop, tablet, or even a phone. ZWO offers an excellent accessory for their cameras, focuser and filter wheels, that includes the ability to polar align, autofocus, live stack, or do full astrophotography sequences, all from your iOS or Android tablet or phone. I use one of these ASI Air products to wirelessly control all of my equipment and to view live stacking on my iPad. This eliminates the need to carry, connect, or power a laptop. At our public observing events, I find it very enjoyable to answer people's questions about astronomy, but also to be able to talk about the actual object I have on the screen. Instead of repeating equipment usage instructions for each person individually, like look here and focus here and oh, don't touch that. I can just have an ongoing conversation with everyone gathered around. Public interaction becomes a group activity instead of an individual and repeating one-on-one -on -one experience. Whether it's a galaxy, a star cluster or a nebula, Everyone is able to view the object simultaneous while a natural conversation with questions and answers happens without instructional interruptions or how to use the equipment uh, instructions. I do try to attend all of our member and public events, though I miss one now and then due to travel or other commitments. But if you'd like to see EAA in action, you're always welcome to come over and have a look and ask questions about the gear, the process, uh, or the capabilities. Now these uh, that I'm showing now are not the best examples, but I wanted to show that even the worst examples are still capable of showing more detail and sensitivity than uh, you might see visually alone. Uh, and you can see in these pictures, uh, there's a, uh, light pollution and uh, some serious vignetting in one, uh, but still you can, you can make out the galaxy, you can see what you're looking at, and you can see uh, structure and detail that uh, uh, you don't normally see in just an eyepiece alone. So uh, that really is the end of my presentation and, and I can take questions now or uh, as suggested earlier by email or uh, at any time. Great, thanks, David. 
David, I have a couple. I have, I have a few questions. <laughs> sure, uh, sure. If you don't mind, um, the uh, basically let's let's talk um, about price here. What what kind of just to get started on something like that, what kind of cost? Let's say I have a telescope already and I have a, a mount, like I have the normal telescope, whatever, and mount. What would it cost to get something that would allow me to see? And say I have a computer too. What would be the what would be the cost of getting started in something like that? Well, that that's really a great question, and uh, the answer is going to be different for everybody. Just just as you mentioned, it, it some of it depends on what you already have. You've already got uh, the, the telescope, the mount, a computer. Um, so basically, you know, you might want to add a camera. Now, people do use DSLRs. That's possible. Um, I've never done that. But uh, any kind of DSR, DSR that you can connect uh, to your computer and control through ASCOM, perhaps, uh, is capable of, of doing live stacking. Uh, and like I said, most people at that point would go to a CMOS camera. So you might be looking at uh, one of the popular CMOS cameras. Um, and the software, uh, there's a lot of uh, free software or very low, low cost software. Um, SharpCap uh, is free. There's also a, a paid version of it, which isn't very expensive. Um, and so, you know, basically for you, it sounds like maybe the cost of a camera would really get you going. And what um, would that, with what, what you have? Like a camera that you mentioned, what would that be? Like just a, a ballpark figure just for, yeah, kind of a low to mid range, mid, mid end type thing. Um, and I just, I don't, I mean, just, just really ballpark. Is, I, right. I, just uh, I would say um, looking at the, the common ZWO or QHY um, cameras, uh, you could go anywhere from, uh, I'm trying to think of what the price of like a, an ASI 224 is. Um, $200 maybe. Okay. Um, you know, anywhere up to, you know, <laughs> you know the sky's the limit. Right. Uh, $2,000 $2, for uh, an ASI 2600. Okay. Uh, you know, just depending on, you know, and, and there are ways to um, better match certain uh, cameras to the type of telescope you have, whether it's a refractor or SCT or, or, or whatnot. But you can use any type of telescope. Um, some are uh, maybe um, more uh, flexible than others. Uh, you know, an, an SCT, for example, um, is a, a great kind of jack of all trades telescope because you can use a reducer, you can use uh, Barlow's, you can use Hyperstar uh, to achieve many different focal lengths. Um, whereas you might not be able to do that as easily with a refractor. Um, so, you know, there are advantages and disadvantages uh, to any type of telescope, but any of them can be used. Um, pretty much like uh, any camera as well. One other quick question, if you don't mind, you had a slide kind of sort of toward the beginning, maybe the third or fourth slide, it had the word AP in it. And I was kind of curious as to what, it was a list of things. And I don't remember exactly what, what, the, what the slide said, but it looked like it was, um, I think it had- I think that was probably a reference to um, astrophotography. Oh, okay, okay. AP. Yeah, all right. Yes. Okay, thanks. Which camera, David, um, uh, which has, uh, I'm talking about a DSLR uh, auto, ma, ma, for stacking. Uh, it, autom it does automatically stacking. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of any DSLRs that will do automatic stacking. Uh, you would connect the DSLR uh, to the computer uh, with a USB cable, and then the software running on the computer, uh, for example, SharpCap uh, could use that uh, to uh, then stack the images as they came in. Um, I know there are analog uh, video cameras such as the Revolution Imager, and I believe uh, someone showed uh, a Revolution Imager on Gadget Night. That was one of the meetings I regret regrettably uh, missed out on. Uh, but I heard a Revolution Imager was, was 
maybe demonstrated there. Uh, that's an analog video camera that does have internal stacking. But uh, the digital cameras, the DSLRs, I'm not aware of any model that has internal uh, stacking. So that's all done with the software on the computer, um, whether that be a Windows computer or the Raspberry Pi uh, type of computer, that's all done in the software. Okay, there's a software called uh, Backyard uh, Nikon or Backyard Canon. Uh, it's pretty low cost, it's like 30, 40 bucks, but I believe that does have auto stacking and all that stuff, but it's dedicated for DSLRs. Um, I yeah, actually have it for my Nikon. Yeah, I've heard there's uh, maybe two versions, one for Nikon and another one for Canon. Yeah. EO yep. EOS. Yeah, uh, yeah, EOS, yep. It's yeah. called Backyard uh, Stacking? Back, uh, backyard. There's Backyard Nikon. EOS and Backyard Nikon, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, that yeah, works pretty good. There are a couple of questions in the uh, chat uh, that you might want to look at asking about the Mac users and uh, suggestions for lower price telescope. Um, for Mac users, um, honestly, I don't know. I'm not a Mac user, so I don't know what, uh, what software runs on that. Um, there, one of the sources I would check would be uh, a web source would be Cloudy Nights, the forums there. There is an EAA or Electronically Assisted Astronomy uh, forum dedicated uh, to this practice. And uh, uh, I know that answer or that question has been asked many times and I think answered many times. Uh, but that's not something that I've ever looked into because I don't have Mac myself. Um, as far as the, the, um, the, the telescopes, um, suggestions for a, a, a lower price range telescope. Uh, I'm sorry? It's nothing. Um, you know, really it, it would be the, the, you know, the same lower priced uh, telescopes that you might go for uh, in any situation visually because virtually any of them can be used. But uh, I might recommend um, uh, a small wide field refractor. Uh, those are very easy to use. Um, and you can get, uh, you know, doublets or triplets uh, so the smaller ones, uh, uh, I've used a 50 millimeter, um, but uh, you can use a 60 um, millimeter refractor, uh, your smaller reflectors. Um, I think they've got a, um, I don't know, they still have it available. The One Sky, I believe, is a four inch uh, reflector, collapsible uh, reflector. Uh, if you can uh, attach a camera to it, you can use it for EAA. Uh, what, David, what size are the uh, scopes that you are generally bringing to uh, public viewing nights? Um, the, ones that I, the one that I generally bring is a 50 millimeter uh, refractor, a four element refractor. Um, I've also brought a uh, small Skywatcher uh, 102, uh, which I, you know, I think that's four inch. Uh, a Max Sudov uh, for the longer focal length, uh, you know, when we're doing planetary. Uh, I recently got a, a new 70 millimeter. Um, again, my style, I like to travel and uh, keep them light. Uh, I don't want to have to carry it out in two or three pieces. Uh, and uh, the 70 millimeter, even the 50 millimeter refractor that I use um, gives me great results. Uh, again, uh, when compared to looking at an eyepiece, um, it's just wonderful. And uh, for those who have seen uh, the screen at the, at the outings, uh, I think they've all uh, enjoyed that view as well. So are people using Raspberry Pi primarily just to transmit the information from the camera to a laptop or is it actually processing some of it? It's actually, you're generally doing the processing. So the Raspberry Pi uh, is really the workhorse um, doing the stacking, controlling the equipment, uh, guiding if, if you want to use guiding, you don't have to. Uh, but it's doing all of that and you're really using uh, the device that you're connecting to the Raspberry Pi, whether it's a, a laptop or a tablet, um, 
just as that remote viewing screen. So it's uh, just a monitor at that point. Correct. The, all the processing, the stacking, that's happening on, on the Raspberry Pi. Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah, a lot, you know, a lot of people are concerned that, you know, it doesn't have the processing power and the Pis um, have plenty of power to do that. Uh, they're not running, you know, large OSs with, with all these other services and so forth. Um, so they uh, work very well, uh, whether it's um, K-Stars or Astroberry, there's a couple of uh, Raspbian Pi builds specifically for astronomy that, uh, you know, so they've got the planetary program on there and they're using um, uh, a platform called Ecos uh, and Indy to uh, connect to the mounts and, and the cameras and uh, any other equipment that you have and to uh, take those images and stack them live and then send the result of that stack remotely to your to your monitor device. You know, we talk about maybe doing a, a telescope building uh, special interest group, but I, I would throw equally uh, in there maybe to do an assembly like, like that. A system um, building thing. Yeah. Uh, if you were interested in <laughs> leading something like that, you might, I don't know, there might be a little interest in that. There might be, and I, and I do find that can be an interesting topic myself. I mean, I do know that a lot of people um, acquire equipment, um, you know, one piece at a time. Uh, maybe they're on a budget or uh, their viewing uh, habits or their interests change. And so they get a piece that um, might be, you know, more geared towards, uh, you know, this or that uh, interest at the time, but later they're interested in something else. And so how to build a system uh, completely that, um, you know, uh, kind of sees the forest through the trees, you know, right. a whole system that it's balanced and, and uh, each piece is kind of made to optimize the strengths of all the other pieces uh, instead of uh, working at cross purposes or, um, uh, you know, stressing on maybe the weaker points and, and becoming uh, the worst thing for the job at hand. You know, it all kind of okay. depends on your goals. Right. So, yeah, yeah, that could be interesting. Isn't there an eyepiece type device where you put it in the eyepiece and then you can actually see it kind of like a, kind of like a, kind of like instead of watching it optically, you're watching it through a, uh, on like a TV screen or something like that. I don't know. Where were we talking about getting one of those one time? That's uh, the uh, revolution imager. That's basically what the revolution imager is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and that's, and that's an analog video uh, camera. Um, and Malin Cam also has one based on the same technology. Uh, I think it's probably a little, little higher resolution uh, maybe than the Revolution Imager, but um, th those require, uh, you know, a very small power source, 12 volt, uh, in order to power the camera itself, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe a small um, LCD screen. Uh, the Revolution Imager I know comes with one, uh, but you can connect uh, even larger screens to that uh, output. Um, those are those are interesting cameras. They they come out of the uh, security camera market, um, uh, and that's what makes them useful for low light application. Uh, but interestingly, they have internal stacking, uh, which is really neat. Very interesting. All right, thank you, David. Thank you. That was great. So yeah, we're looking forward to the next season of public observing sessions and people can hopefully show up for once and check out your setup. Have a look. All right, our, our last presentation is from a uh, old, new again, then old and new again member. Uh, he first joined probably, what, 1993 and uh, he was around for a few years and dropped off and came back for a bit very briefly, then dropped off for a long time, and now he's back again. So uh, we'll welcome uh, Pete Mumbauer, who took a little trip to the Big Island. Thank you, Richard. Let's see here. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? Yep. Okay. So back in uh, 2019, before the world came to a halt, uh, me and my wife had our uh, 20th wedding anniversary, and we decided to go to Hawaii for once. Um, 
<clears throat> and why we were there. Let's see if I can get this thing to work. Um, we decided to um, go up to Mauna Kea. Now, Hawaii, everyone's like, hey, let's go to Mauna Where exactly is, uh, um, in Hawaii is, it's the whole island chain. It is on the big island, which is the far lower right of the Hawaiian chain. Typically, you fly into uh, Honolulu, which is where the little yellow squiggly lines are here. And if you look here, you got 20, here's your latitudes here. It's actually below 20 latitude. So typically, you take your major airlines and you fly into the big island. And then you take another airline, Honolulu, or you take a boat if you don't like flying anymore. Um, and you fly over to Hilo, which is the yellow arrow. And they have a small airport there. Uh, we ended up staying at a hotel right on the beach and all that fun stuff being, you know, anniversary, you got to be romantic and all that fun blah stuff. Um, and Mauna Kea is actually the uh, volcano on top of a volcano, you know, top is where the red is. And to actually get there, there's a highway which divides the island in half, more or less. That's the fast way to get to the other side. Kona is on the left side. Um, that's where all the really touristy area is. Um, beaches, all that really nice beaches around that side. So you can take the uh, highway to drive across. Um, and that's what we did. <clears throat> we drove, took the shortcut. We didn't want to go all the way around. That takes a while. Of course, we were there for 10 days, no kids. So, hey, you know, whatever. So to get all the way up to the observatory, you actually um, get off the highway and you drive up this long winding mountain road and you make it up to the visitor center. And they make you stop there or they really recommend you stop there for 30 minutes because you are going from sea level to 14,000 feet, which is a major drop in oxygen. 40% um, less oxygen actually at the top than it is at the bottom. So, and they actually have warning signs, like if you've been scuba diving or plan on scuba diving, you don't want to do this because you probably won't make it type of thing. Um, so the visitor center is at 9,200 feet up. It's a really nice parking lot. Um, actually, you can see my wife there. She's at some picnic tables. We had, I think we had some lunch there or something. Um, typically, if you want to do observing or go, um, uh, bring your telescope, or actually they have some, as you'll see in a minute here, they have um, um, a public observing program. You can go up there um, and do stuff. Uh, gift shop, get your typical trinkets. I got, you know, I got my coffee mug from here. I got some shirts, all the good stuff. Um, so you drive all the way up to here, get up to this point, get inside to the visitor center, and this is their telescope they actually drag out. It's a, it's a Celestron, uh, uh, Rasa, I think it's 11 inch or maybe the eight inch. Uh, it's like a hyperstar, but it's just dedicated. It's on an astrophysics uh, 1100 GTO. And this was my secret insertion point of the idea. Hey, honey, well, I'd like that mount someday. So, you know, that's a pretty cool mount. So um, I actually did get it years later. Um, so they have some really nice equipment. They drag it out into the, obviously they use the Will Wheelie system, which is really nice. They, take it out there and that actually that little guardian that little um, barrier system that wasn't keeping the kids there away they were climbing all over the thing wasn't good i think richard probably could relate to that back in the uh um uh, uh the museum days they probably climbed over everything you know the little signs don't stop them but um it's a really nice um gift shop visitor center you can ask all sorts of questions um yeah, so you're going up a volcano and they really want you to have four wheel drive. Super important because while it's all paved driving up to there, once you get to the visitor center, it's not paved, it's dirt. Actually, you can see in this background, there's some rocks and stuff. And at the very top of this picture, you can see they actually do you some service and show what happens when you don't have four wheel drive. There's cars tipped over, crunched, destroyed. I mean, little cars, I mean, this road is like serious. They even show, you know, you don't have like low gear, your car catches on fire, your brakes just, you know, fire. It's totally crazy. Um, 12 to 20 degree slopes going up. I mean, this is some pretty serious stuff. And you got, and it's a three and a half mile drive. So big sign, hey, you better have four wheel drive. 
Um, obviously, there's a lot of rental car places. Um, there's only one place that I think I'm aware of. It's in Hilo that actually rents four wheel drive and they actually allow you to drive it up there. Most places, they, even if they have four-wheel drive, they say you're not allowed to take it up there. Obviously, people don't listen to people usually, and they, as you'll see here in a minute. Um, actually, I'm gonna scoot back here. Yeah, you can see down at the bottom, there's more examples at the bottom, two more Jeeps on their side. There's a car on its roof, another car on its roof, green Jeep on its side. Crazy, you don't wanna drive fast, so. Oh, I had more fun with driving up this thing than anything. Um, got a little video here. Hopefully this works. This is us driving up the hill. You look like you're going way too fast. Drive fast, take chances. Looks like the moon. Look out for that squirrel. Do they warn you about snow on that drive, Pete? Yep. Now we're going to pause here. We got a convertible Mustang, two wheel drive coming down. Yeah, this guy ain't smart. Uh, when I came back down, I didn't see him off the side or buried, at least that I didn't find. Um, crazy, crazy. Uh, I don't know. He was probably drunk. Yeah, you know he was riding his brakes the whole time down. <laughs> yeah. He didn't, have any, he didn't have any brakes left. <laughs> no. Yeah, when I was going down, it was low gear, and it was still touching the brakes. My wife's like, is that safe? I'm like, oh, yeah, this is how you do it. So... But you can see you're up above the clouds. It's all that fun stuff. It isn't too bad when you follow the rules. So finally, we get up there. And this actually a picture I made up there. Um, summit, 13,803 feet. Um, I, I rounded up to 14, so it sounds cooler. Um, and you got the Subaru telescope. You got the CAX. And then you got the, uh, the NASA infrared telescope over there. And it's actually paved at the very, 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 very top. Um, so, and uh, my running watch, it does work that high. My altimeter worked at 13,576 feet. Uh, being a runner, there's all, you always hear about all these, you know, like African runners, they train at altitude. I said, you know what? I got to try running at altitude. That was a bad idea. I ran for like a half mile up there, about killed myself. Um, actually got, yeah, it was not, not a good idea. Anyway, so while we're up there, um, trying to think here, what do we got? Oh, this uh, it's a little, it's windy. Got the Gemini telescope. Um, and that's the, oh, which one is that? Is it the Canada France Hawaii telescope? Yes, that's what it is. Yep. Okay. So from this vantage point, when you come up, uh, this is, I'm kind of standing in the same spot, kind of pulled off to the side of the road. And this was my first kind of vantage point to get out, take a bazillion pictures. Um, from the left here on the Right down here is the Caltech Submillimeter Observatory. It's actually not in use anymore. They abandoned it, basically. Um, you got the James Clark Maxwell Telescope. Um, the Smithsonian, uh, the Submillimeter Array. Get some closer picture of these. And then the Subaru Telescope. That's a big guy. <clears throat> Pretty cool. If you look up here, it's obviously there's no vegetation. Obviously, you're, you're way up there. Um, and I think someone mentioned earlier before the meeting started, there's actually a blizzard warning right now at the summit. It is crazy. 100 mile an hour winds. Uh, I don't know how much snow, but way more than we really want. Um, so yeah, the Caltech Submeter Telescope. It's a 10.4 10 10 10 meter. Um, it was designed to go into the terahertz, I believe, um, frequency range. Um, yeah, they dismantled it. They they stopped using it, lack of funding basically, and they just it just sits there now. Um, 
it's kind of a bummer when you see the funding drop for some of these science projects. Um, I don't know what they're, I don't think they're going to replace it with anything right there. Um, I think there's a, like a, yeah, they like to, uh, you know, keep the mountaintops since it's uh, sacred for the islanders, um, for the Hawaiians. There's been a lot of controversy with a 30 meter telescope construction. They haven't even started that. A lot of um, uh, issues with that. So uh, the Caltech Submeter uh, Observatory, this was uh, actually one of my favorite pictures. You got the little pads here. Um, these aren't really that big. I was surprised. I was thinking these things were going to be like, you know, Jody Foster and Contact and Humongous. No, they weren't. These things are like, you know, shed size in your backyard, eight by 10, eight by eight, it's like all observatory size. These things aren't very big. They're pretty cool looking, but um, millimeter um, all array, they link them together and do all that cool stuff. Um, it looked like Mars. I imagined myself like in the Martian, you know, <laughs> it was it was pretty cool to be here. Um, it was cold. Um, so I was the one outside taking all the pictures. Uh, the Gemini North Telescope, uh, humongous, eight meter. Uh, the Gemini south, south is located in Chile, so they can have, you know, their twin doing uh, observations. Um, usually you'll see the cars parked everywhere. They don't, at least for me, they weren't talking to me. I don't know what it was. Um, they were busy just going back and forth doing their job. I don't know if he's got to know, know people on the inside to get into these things. Um, Usually, I don't know. If anyone has any tips, if I ever get back there, I need to know people, I guess. <clears throat> so, yes, um, there is weather at 14,000 feet. I was, we were up by the Gemini telescope and we were just kind of standing around and all of a sudden, it reminded me of the Texas Star Party. We had dust devils going on and we had a dust devil form. Um, and it was like a serious, big time. Yeah, my wife's saying, walk away. No, not me. You walk closer for these things. So, um, yeah, that little observatory in the background, University of Hawaii's 2.2 meter. Um, I'm not even sure what type of telescope or what kind of program they do in there. But that um, dust devil kind of, or whatever it is, not, definitely not a tornado. Um, it lasted for about five minutes, just kind of going around that whole area, just doing its thing. Um, I posted it to my Instagram account and I had like all the weather accounts go nuts over it and they're, hey, can we share this, blah, blah, blah. I guess it's pretty rare for being that high. Oops. Um, yeah, high winds, porta potties, you got to strap them down, I found out up there. So I'm sure those things were not strapped down at one point and they had to strap them down. So hopefully someone wasn't inside the porta potty when it blew over at one point. But um, they did a pretty good job. I mean, I mean, those suckers are cranked down for those uh, metal guides to, um, at least they put porty potties up there. This is right by the spot where you go, if you want to go up there to uh, watch the sunrisers, um, yes, yeah, or sun, sunset actually. Um, they generally don't want people up there at night. Um, obviously you can't turn your car headlights on because they get really upset about that. Um, same thing, no, no cell phones allowed, no Bluetooth, no Wi-Fi nothing all the, the your phones that's all electromagnetic spectrum you got all the sub millimeter arrays obviously lights at night they don't like that um but so you can go up there still and there's some um commercial uh, tour groups that down in hilo and uh, kona that they you know have a bus they go up there and you can watch the, they can actually do observe and they'll drag a couple dobs up there um you can do some observing from the summit um from what I understand, the observing is actually better down at the visitor center because there's more oxygen. Your eyes start going wacky and losing their sensitivity. So you actually see more stars at, you know, 5,000 feet below. Um, and then obviously when you hear about Mauna Kea, you think about the Keck telescopes. These are the, the, the big guys up there. Uh, they soon won't be too, the big guys anymore if the, the 30 meter gets built. Um, two uh, 10 meter telescopes, uh, one built in 93 and one 96. Um, when they originally were built, the whole idea was they could be connected as an interferometer. And for years, I actually doing some research for this and actually at the, um, when we were there, 
it wasn't an optical interferometer from visual wavelengths, it was more inf infrared. Um, and sadly, that was discontinued too for lack of funding. So they don't even do the interferometer anymore. Um, so they're used independently. Um, they do use adaptive optics. Um, they shoot to lasers or do artificial stars, but um, it's sad because when it's in interferometer mode, it's an 85 meter telescope. 85 millimeters, and so yeah, five milli arc second resolution. That is, that that is as of right now. That would be the largest telescope on the planet um, when it's combined outside of like the very, um, yeah, the very large uh, array uh, radio telescope. Which actually, that's one picture I did miss when you're driving up the mountain. There's a little side road where actually one of the radio telescopes for the very large array is actually located, um, and I believe it's right across. There's a lake up here which I didn't know about. I mean, actually, I think it was dried, dried up at the time. But anyway, so inside the, um, the Keck telescope, there's actually a visitor center. Someone can, we can actually go inside, uh, the only place up there. So they have, it's not really big. You can just go inside. They have like uh, this little um, plaque um, that's set up in there that tells you a little bit about the construction. You can see the, you know, the diagram of how big it is inside the dome. It, they missed a tight fit. Um, they do have a bathroom inside too, which is better than the porta potty, I'll tell you that. Um, and they do have what I call the cage. It's this, you walk into this little like glass room, it's totally plexiglass in and you can see little barbells, little bars basically that keeps, I guess, telescopes from falling on you. But here you can see the Keck One telescope and all of its segmented mirrors, because to get to 10 meters, it uses, uh, I believe, 1.1 meter um, uh, honeycomb or uh, hex mirrors. And this is it. It's a you know big uh, alt azimuth mount, um, humongous aperture fever. When I saw that, I was like, man, I have a small telescope here. Um, it's in the park position. Um, and I believe you, you couldn't see it from here, but they have the big, uh, they have a big, white screen for doing flat frames. You know, obviously you got to calibrate the Keck telescope too. It has optical imperfections. Um, each of those mirrors from reading some of the stuff there, they they have little actuators. So part of the um, the adaptive optics, it can slightly distort every single mirror so it can, you know, counteract the atmosphere. And being at 14,000 feet, you're already a good chunk of the way out of the atmosphere as far as where most of the turbulence happens. And so, you get some really good images from up there. Um, but you can see it's just really minimum in there. It's just metal frames or they do everything they can to keep it, you know, very, uh, it can cool down very quickly. Um, and that's it. Um, besides just driving around, there was a few, you know, service roads and this and that. Um, and then uh, obviously driving back down took forever because it was driving downhill and you had to go slow. Um, we had a really good time. It's definitely, if you're ever in Hawaii, you have to, like I said, you go to Mauna Kea, you got to get over to the big island, which is um, typically an airline flight, which is, I don't know what the prices are. It's uh, Hawaiian Airlines is, I think, the only one that services it. You fly into Hilo. There's one one rental company that takes a Toyota for Forerunner, and that's how you drive up to the top. Or you do a, or do a commercial uh, tour group, and it'll take you up there, too. Um, especially if you want to see um, like the sunrise sunset because they'll have like hot cocoa and little snacks and whatnot. But if you do plan on it, do what I didn't do. Bring a jacket because you're going to Hawaii. You don't bring a jacket going to Hawaii because you're thinking like, you know, yeah, you can be like Hawaiian 5.0. You can be shorts and you don't need a winter jacket. It was cold up there. So did you take any of the... Uh chopper tours and uh, hover over the volcano? Uh, no chopper tours. Um, actually, mono, uh, the actual volcano at the time, the entire lava lake had emptied. There was no lava at all in the lake itself. We, we, we went there, we walked around the, um, the whole, um, it was actually a, a, a volcano observatory was there. They have one there. Um, and that's what they had talked about. It's like, <laughs> there's no lava in there. So we went over to the various spots to look into the, main pit and really there was nothing it was black he had steam coming out a couple years back ago they had the big the big um uh eruption where it kind of went through and like took out like neighborhoods 
we drove down the road and I got some pictures. It's like 15 foot tall, like, you know, frozen lava is like, and there was still like power crews, like working power lines, trying to reroute the power and stuff. Um, I just read here though, like last month or so that the lake is now filled back up with lava. So the lava is back. So um, it's just such a, it's a, it's one of the most active volcanic places on earth. It's um, even the, um, even when you're walking around the rim there, you put your hand, there's like the vents and stuff. That's some hot stuff. There's lava down there. I know it was down there, <laughs> but um, it was definitely worthwhile. The, they said because the, the, the helicopter tours were, were pretty good because um, obviously going over the lava and stuff, if it was there, because usually it would go all the way down and then go off into the ocean because they have the big cliffs. That was pretty, if it was going, we probably would have done that. Um, we went to the north side of the island. That's where, um, that's where they filmed like Jurassic Park and stuff where they had all the big, you know, the big view, you know, it looked like Jurassic Park. Yeah, I, I found where that is. I'm pretty sure there's probably dinosaurs there somewhere. Uh, Peter, but, uh, is yeah. this the same place uh, they were going to build a new telescope, but they they had to abandon the plan uh, because of the native uh, Hawaiians uh, object to? Yeah, yeah, that's the 30 meter telescope. That was right. um, um, basically where the the Subaru telescope is and the, the, the millimeter array, there's a little service road that went up um, and the site's kind of, there's actually a little service road that goes there, but yeah, basically the, the, the native, uh, the Hawaiian, native Hawaiians, yeah. it's sacred ground. And they're like, you guys just can't keep building observatories up here and stuff. And they actually had a sit-in where they sat across the, the, cert, the road that you drive up to the visitor center. That was blocked for like a long time. People would just, the, they would just protest and then no one could go up there, even the, um, the contractors. So um, actually the, um, the guy, the, the rock, you know, the Dwayne Johnson, he's, he's from Hawaii, actually from Hilo area. Um, he was down there a couple of times supporting obviously their, the whole thing. Cause at the very top that I, that there, I said there was a lake up there. There's actually an altar there. And actually there is a Hawaiian, yeah, no, a oh, there's a Hawaiian queen and a, a king, I think, but they go up there once in a great while to do whatever. But, um, but yeah, so the 30 meter, meter telescope right now is like on hold. So they don't want any more. They, it was moved to another island in Pacific, Atlantic Ocean, right? Um, Not yet. They really want to. They re really want to build it at the Keck site because it's much higher elevation, so it's even better yeah. for infrared astronomy. Yeah. Oh. Okay. How cool so, was it? Yeah. Other uh, other thing is that that guided tour is uh, just a one day guided tour, uh, like. A... Um. Well, yeah, it's pretty much all day because you start off pretty much in the morning. Because okay. I mean, when we left Hilo, I mean, we left at like. I mean, we got down to the rental place first thing in the morning, like eight o'clock, and we didn't get back till the afternoon. And we didn't really, um, we didn't go up for the sunset or anything. And I mean, we didn't stay for the sunset and everything. So it would be like an all day affair to do the whole, you know, do the guided tour. So they, they, they do tell you about that. So it'd be almost all day. It wouldn't be, well, obviously if you do the whole overnight where they bring the telescopes, you would get back quite a bit later. Um, um, I think someone said about temperature wise. Yeah, yeah it was I like what, what it was like there. You said you didn't bring a jacket or a coat or something, so I'm just wondering what it, what it, it was like. Twenty two degrees, I think. It was it wasn't horrible, but from like eighty five at the was it windy too? Pretty windy. Yeah, it got it got pretty windy up there. Um, and that was the hardest part actually driving down and up because sometimes I'd get buffeted driving up there and I'd feel it, and the roads sure. weren't there wasn't much of a road there because sometimes I'd actually have to stop. And you have to get as much as you can over to the side and let the next person kind of squeeze by because you really couldn't because you're almost like mirror to mirror going by there <laughs> on a few spots. It was just super tight. And sometimes it was wide. Um, I thought I had read somewhere that they were trying, they, they want to like pave the rest of the way up, but I I have no idea. I don't even know how they get the mirrors, like segment, even a one meter mirror driving that up there and that just blows my mind. I don't know how they do that. The surface of the road, uh, Pete, looked sort of um, grab, made of gravel or some kind of dust. So yeah. So I don't know if paving would be very 
uh, could stay very long in a climate like that or yeah that's a good point yeah it was a very loose loose gravel like um yeah, vol well, volcanic <laughs> gravel so yeah very loose all right thank you pete that was fantastic yep. mm -hmm. so uh just remember everyone if you have a special interest like you know eaa or you know, favorite topic in the science of astronomy or history or take a trip or, you know, like to Mauna Kea or some other observatory or go to a star party, you know, you could put together just a short presentation for astronomy open house. It can be as short as maybe 10 minutes, but you, you saw tonight, most of us, uh, I think all of us went a little longer um, than we kind of had intended. So it, it's easy to give what you imagine to be a short presentation to, to be a bit, bit longer. So don't feel like you have to give an hour long presentation at a general meeting. It could be to, to something like this. So um, keep that in mind. We'll, we'll, we'll try to keep doing it, especially when we get to meet back in person one day. Okay, so let's go ahead and segue into the annual meeting. So we do have a little bit of business to take care of, unfortunately. And the one thing I wanted to show first, um, just I, I'm, I'm not going to read this and in, in, you know word for word, uh, but this is uh, the section of our bylaws that shows what the duties are of each uh, position. So, so you can see, for example, you know, I'll just highlight the three main ones here because like the first one and the last one are the same for everyone. You know, these are the basic duties of the president, you know, just to reside, uh, you know, preside over the general and board meetings and be the official rep of the KAS and award, you know, give awards to members like Astronomical League awards and stuff like that. So, you know, Everyone knows that I, you know, look for the speakers and do membership renewals. You know, that has nothing to do with being president. So it's really at its heart a very, very uh, simple job. And, you know, frankly, you know, with vice president here, you know, uh, the, the vice president just basically stands in for the president if, if he or she is absent. And then uh, the president, the vice president is supposed to conduct an annual audit of our library equipment and treasury. But, uh, that hardly ever happens. And, you know, if we get desperate, we really don't even need a vice president. Sorry, sorry, Jack, but it's true. <laughs> uh, so, of course, the uh, the duties of the treasurer are, are a bit more extensive. Um, uh, pretty much I, I maintain the membership list because uh, Rich, uh, I, I just got used to doing that because Rich Mather was never great at updating me with new members. And so people wouldn't get the prime focus newsletter or the reflector and our membership cards and that really annoyed the hell out of me. So I just kind of took that over and I still do that just, just to make sure I have the current email list and, and it can um, send emails and newsletters and all that sort of thing. But uh, you know, that that's part of the treasurer's job too. And then you can see all the other duties here, you know, basically maintain our financial records. And then we have uh, the dual position here, you know, the Alcor and secretary, you know, not as many members do astronomical league, uh, programs as they should. So the Alcor uh, position isn't too involved. And, you know, the secretary is just supposed to maintain a written record. It technically does not say here, you have to write the minutes for the newsletter, but that's kind of implied. And then we created a few years ago, the publicity manager uh, uh, position, which is, um, you know, really valuable. It takes a lot of time and effort off me from, from doing this myself. And so, you know, basically, just sending out press releases. And then we have the uh, members at, at large positions, which are called non-officer directors here. And as you've heard me say many times, you know, these are the positions I don't think we need at all. Uh, you know, I'm kind of skating aside with vice president, but with members at large, I've long held we don't need them, and uh, but we still have them. And uh, we're doing pretty good with nominations uh, for there, but of course, uh, more are always welcome. So let me uh, do a new share here. And here is the current nominees. So again, we can take uh, new nominations, uh, last minute nominations for president, vice president, uh, treasurer, secretary. We can even take more for publicity manager, but uh, uh, Andy Robbins, I'm not sure he joined us here tonight, but he's gonna retire from WMUK as a news director at the end of this year. So. 
he's uh, pretty qualified to be the publicity manager, but you're certainly welcome to run against Andy. But um, And I, Andy I, just renewed for two years. I have his renewal form with me tonight. So, Oh, that's he great. Renewed, he just renewed for two more years. Well, there you go. <laughs> so, so we can take nominations for any of these positions uh, right now. And, of course, we only have four member at large positions, but we have seven nominees. And uh, so, but just remember, if you're one of the three, you know, that does not get a position on the board, you know, who, who freaking cares? Uh, there, 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 there's plenty of other ways you can help. You know, we have committees that have kind of started and stalled over the years. There, there's plenty of other things you can do uh, to, to help the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society. So, you know, do not take it personally if you, if you don't make it as a member at large. So do we have any nominations for any of these positions? Uh, I'll say if I am president again, I'm gonna be a pain in everyone's ass next year. So just, there you go. <laughs> now that's a campaign speech. There you go. Platform? <laughs> that, that's my platform. I'm gonna be a pain in the ass next year. So does that- I have to know before I pay my dues. <laughs> Situation normal. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Situation normal. You, you don't so have that, to that's change. that phrase, Jack. What's that, Don? I'm going to put that in a t-shirt. PIA. Situation normal. <laughs> okay, so seriously, any, any nominations? I mean, for anything. Going once. Going twice. Third time's the charm. Okay, so here's what I'm going to propose is we will elect the officers by acclamation because what I'll probably ask uh, Molly Williams to do because she's, she's agreed to put together uh, like surveys for us as, as we'll basically put together like a, a, a sort of short ballot for just the members at large. And we will email that out to everyone maybe tomorrow or maybe I'll, I'll give uh, the members at large a few days because uh, it might be a good idea for all the members at large, uh, member at large nominees to write up maybe just a short paragraph, you know, maybe one or two or three sentences about themselves because as we email this to the membership, they're not going to have a clue probably who most of these people are because, you know, we have nearly 400 people, but do we ever see any of them? Uh, no. So um, it would be a good idea to do that. So I'll, <clears throat> I'll, I'll just kind of make the motion we uh, vote for all these people or elect all these people by acclamation. Anybody want to second my resolution there? Or I will. Support. Okay. So all, let me sh uh, stop sharing the screen here so we can see everyone and, uh, or, or, or we'll just have to, we can, keep, uh, people can put eyes in the chat or sh show, show their hands or something if they don't want to share their screen. So hands up for those that want to go ahead and uh, elect those uh, officers. Okay. Anybody opposed either uh, speak now or say it in the chat or forever hold your peace. Time's up. Okay, so congratulations to our uh, old again and new again, or new officers. We'll, we'll let Andy know. And uh, we will let you know on the, um, we'll, we'll get that member at large ballot out to you, uh, maybe hopefully no later than Monday. But again, if you're a nominee for member at large, I'll, I'll send you an email, but um, I'll ask you for just a really short paragraph about yourself, because again, most people won't know who you are. Because we can't, we can't vote here by Zoom. I, I just, I, I just don't know how to do it. I'm cer certainly open to suggestions, but that was my idea. I can make a, I can make a form, or I can make a, a form in Microsoft uh, right now if you wanted me to. Well, I think the Survey Monkey would be a lot easier. You just kind of click on your little thingies and. <laughs> yeah. I have idea what you were talking about, Richard. Just having a. Send it out an email to the members and do it that way. Okay. Yeah, just a little. It'll, it'll be like an email link, uh, you know, to, to the or a link in an email to the survey thing, and you just mm -hmm. click on the four people you want, and then there we go. Okay. Uh, you leave the election open for uh, twenty four hours after you send it, or something like that. Oh yeah, it'll definitely be open for probably at least yeah at least twenty four hours. 
Um, in the bylaws, uh, I guess we must have uh, some language in there about uh, how we conduct elections. And I'm, I'm assuming I must say, you know, virtual is okay, or if it's if it's not, maybe we need to make that change in our bylaws. Yeah, we're yeah we're kind of changing things on the fly here, but uh, it's it's the best we can do given right. Right, uh, with, with resources yeah, we have. Not person anymore, right? Yeah. It just says <clears throat> annually at our meeting, and it doesn't define what that is, so. I think yeah. We're... Yeah, I, 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 as I recall, yeah, it's, it's very vague, so that's right. that's why Becky was very good on that. She she, she made it very vague, so, we, so it's very flexible. Thank you, Becky. Because <laughs> she definitely helped with that part. Okay, so we'll move on from the annual meeting. See, that wasn't so bad. <laughs> and we'll do the uh, uh, president's report here, I, I believe, is next. Um, so I, I just wanted to mention again, the introduction to amateur astronomy uh, lecture series returns on January 15th. We just crossed uh, 200 registrations today, wow. uh, but, I, but I wanted to mention, I'm kind of disappointed by the number of KAS members that have registered. I've mentioned it a couple of times by email and really gotten next to zero response uh, from the membership. So I'm hoping you renew or, or not renew, but register, uh, you know, soon. You, you can do it toward, you know, the toward the start of the lecture, but it's good to do it a little more in advance. This isn't the kind of thing you can really register for at the last second. You know, people did that and it, it, it can be difficult to get in. Um, well, most of us took the class, you know? Right, right, already. But there are 400 people in the club, so oh. there's plenty of <laughs> other people that haven't taken it yet. So yeah, that 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 doesn't hold water. Um, so there's plenty of new people that have ha ha haven't taken it yet. Have what? Can I audit the class to, and not show up? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's so much for me helping you do Q and A's during them too. So. Well, that, that that's different. So that, that's what I wanted to mention next is I'm still looking for volunteers to um, uh, answer questions in the Q and A. I'll, I'll probably be contacting specific people here soon for at least part one, because you know, part part one is kind of the more technical one, um, you know, tour of the solar system, deep sky objects and stuff like that. So it, it kind of helps know the basics of astronomy. So I'll be contacting people. I think we'll cover that pretty well. Maybe we can have one member do the first hour, somebody do the second hour. So it doesn't maybe take up a good chunk of your afternoon. And I do also need someone to monitor the chat for me and maybe answer uh, the more basic questions in the chat and, uh, you know, uh, publish uh, links in the chat, like the link to sign in so you get your certificate of completion if you attend all five. So I, I definitely would like a, a little additional help this time and, and, and get members involved. And I will send out another email to uh, clubs around the country and world, you know, at least Canada and the UK, uh, about two weeks before. Because the last time I did that, that's when the registrations really came in. I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And I was like overwhelmed. So I, I will try to do that again, but we'll, we'll see what happens. I did want to give a quick update on the membership status. You did see the uh, largest membership list ever in the last or the latest newsletter. And we did pick up one new member today for 262 memberships, which just blows me away. It was actually a gentleman from New Jersey. Uh, so, so that's pretty remarkable. I think, I think he may be our only member from New Jersey. And I, I meant to send out uh, the second uh, renewal email earlier this week, but I got my COVID booster on Monday. And even though I had no ill effects from the first two vaccines, uh, Tuesday, I felt really tired. And I got the shivers like crazy and just felt really, really cold. So uh, mm. I was not doing too well on Tuesday. Plus, for the past two weeks, I've been having ear trouble again. I had I basically started coming down with an ear infection. So I'm recovering from that, too. One of our old members, Dave Brown, who's, who's a doctor at the West Side Medical Center, gave me, you know, checked me out and gave me my medication. So it was good to see Dave Brown again, for those of you that remember uh, him. And I wanted to give uh, good news. Uh, you're off the hook. 
uh, we found a new Facebook manager. It'll be uh, KS member Tommy Brown. I don't know if Tommy is here tonight, but if you're listening, Tommy, thank you very much. We appreciate it. And I wanted to, oh, I uh, wanted to. Uh, Kenzie, you don't got to be the Facebook person anymore. <laughs> I'm sure she's very happy. Uh, so I wanted to mention um, that the 2022 uh, schedule of speakers is taking place. So I wanted to uh, take you to the website here. Uh, so hopefully you see the website now. Of course, you can always go to activities and the general meeting page just to see all the meetings. Um, remember uh, this place, by the way? I don't know if anyone, some of you might not know this place, but this is where we used to meet. <laughs> hey, someone's in my spot. It's still there. That's don't right. worry about it. That picture right. looks familiar. Yeah, it does. I, I probably should give you credit, but um, I, I'm a heartless bastard as a, uh, some people yeah. found out recently. Oh, we know that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so we have, um, uh, of course, I'll mention this later. We have uh, David Williams talk about the Psyche mission to a metal asteroid, an M-type asteroid. Um, so that'll be very exciting. Uh, then February, I am very much looking forward to this. Um, this is easily one of our top five speakers of all time. Uh, we're going to have Dr. Jay Pasikoff from Williams College uh, talk about the sun and the solar eclipses. You might know, you know, Fred Espinak is Mr. Eclipse. That's, he, he probably gave himself that nickname. But uh, Dr. Jay Pasikoff is the true Mr. Eclipse. He's been to 73 solar eclipses, more than anyone that I've ever heard of. They're not all total, of course, but he's been to tons of them. And I don't know if he's going to Antarctica, but uh, he'll be talking about- He'd you know, be there now. He could be there now, yeah. So he'll, he'll be talking about um, all the eclipses he's been to, and he'll uh, get us started on our uh, 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 countdown to 2024. I'm still working on somebody for March. I, I had a speaker in mind, but uh, they haven't I've actually had uh, a couple in mind, but they keep ignoring me. So um, I I'm being ghosted by some people. And then we have uh, Dr. Melissa Trainer, who's gonna talk about the Dragonfly mission to uh, Titan. So that'll be very exciting. Um, I think it's locked in. I haven't got a, a confirmation, uh, but uh, in May, we are gonna have an extremely super duper mega guest speaker. We're going to have none other than the famed cosmologist, Alex Filipenko, be our guest speaker. And um, the, the board was talking about this recently. And of course, as I quickly discovered, they, they really had no idea who, was, who, who he was. So uh, Sinclair, do me a favor. Tell him who Alex Filipenko hey, is. Hey, I know who he is. Yeah, Alex does he have Filipenko a, does he is have one a... of the leading scientists in astronomy. He has been on, you know, you name it. He's been on Nova. He's been linked into programs on the universe, the, the History Channel. Um, he's, I, I say he's, in many respects, as far as the science is concerned, he's above Neil deGrasse Tyson. Tyson's more the face of cosmology, but I really think that Alex Filipenko is absolutely stunning. He knows more about supernovas, I think, than almost anybody except for a handful of people who just literally do these all the time. Uh, he is incredibly excited, enthusiastic about his presentations. He's wonderful. And if you guys had turned this down and said, no, we can't have him, I would have driven over to each of your houses and driven over you with my car several times <laughs> until you said, yes, he can be on our guest speak. Yes, I love that passion. I love you, Sinclair. I think he's the, he's the author for that a great course also, right? Like a, uh, a couple yes. of them, at least two, I think. That's correct. Yeah. He does a couple of them, yep. And yeah. he was also part of the team that just, you know, one of the teams that discovered that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. So major, major speaker. Right. He was linked, he, he was linked into the Harvard group. So that was really pretty cool. And, yes. uh, and I heard him speak once, um, oh, like eight or nine years ago and just absolutely walked away, just blown away. He's, he is incredibly knowledgeable, but he really gets into his, into his presentation. So it's going to be an awesome, awesome speech. 
And I'm hoping to confirm that pretty soon. And then you can see in uh, June, we're going to have Dr. Josh uh, Simon from the Carnegie Institution uh, talk about the dark side of galaxies. Obviously, he'll be talking about uh, the dark matter. And um, yeah, uh, pretty much all these presentations will be via Zoom because I frankly have given up guessing when we're going to meet again. If we do get to meet in person by May or June, uh, we're still going to have uh, Zoom speakers for at least a foreseeable future. But I, I'm still hoping, I, I'm not going to say we're going to meet anytime soon. But, you know, as I found out from Sinclair, we are we are barred from Kamsey. You know, KPS is barred uh, outside organizations from meeting in their facilities. So we couldn't even go back to Kamsey if we wanted to. We, we may end up having to go back to Western uh, for, for a short time if we really want to meet in person again. But of course, right now, things aren't, aren't great in Michigan again. Mike, is, is that uh, like for the foreseeable future, like permanent, even? Um, so the, the last discussion I have, I've had with our director and then what I gather from administration, we are under a mask mandate until the right. end of the second trimester, which is the middle of right. March. Um, mm -hmm. And all of that is based on whether or not, and that includes outside groups coming in, that's based on whether or not we have a vaccination rate that's high enough. So at this point in time, the last I had heard is that tentatively it is possible we may be able to meet in May or June, but only if you have proof of vaccination. Right. Uh, that's the only way you'd be allowed in. And of course, with a mask, unless they decide to rescind the mask mandate, which I'm, I right. don't see that immediately. But I... I do feel like there's a possibility we could be meeting face to face again next September. Um, okay. I, I think we're going to get to that route one way or another. Right now, I'll tell you at, at, at the Math and Science Center, we follow a mask mandate because that's KPS's policy and that's who we work right. under. We have a 95% vaccination rate among our students and 100% among our staff. So we don't seem to have any of the issues. We still have had a handful of COVID cases, but compared to the other high schools in the county, um, we've had a fraction of them. I think I can count on, on you know, two hands the total number of active COVID cases we've had. So, you know, I'm not overly concerned about it. I, I have face-to-face -face with my students every day. It's not an issue. But I, I do know why KPS is keeping people out of our facility for now. Um, but I will, I'm keeping Richard up to date on this. He, he asks about every two months if there's any new word. And as soon as I hear something, I'm gonna shoot him an email almost immediately and then we can work from there. All right, thanks, Mike. The last thing I wanted to mention is, mm -hmm. or say, is I just wanted to uh, thank both uh, Joe Kamiski and Kevin Jung for serving on the KAS board this year. Uh, Joe's been with us on the board since 2014 as a member at large, then a couple of years as the publicity manager. And uh, Kevin uh, has served on the board for the past year. But of course, he's done many, many years uh, on the board of the Grand Rapids Club. Um, so, you know, he's definitely done his bit for, you know, astronomy clubs. But I, I just want to thank them both for serving. And uh, we uh, still plan on uh, seeing you both at general meetings on a regular basis, or I will have Sinclair run you down with his car. <laughs> Good luck. You, you don't have to worry about that. No <laughs> worries. He'll enjoy it. Is that an officer position running people down with a car? Can we get that in the bylaws? <laughs> yeah, there we go. A very special position. I need to get another, another vehicle. I need to get my uh, four-wheel drive back and start doing it. Especially if you want to go to the top of Mauna Kea. All right, uh, moving on. Anybody want to share any observing reports? Ha ha. It's been kind of clear sometimes. You know, um, did anybody see Jupiter uh, the 23rd? It was two, uh, Tuesday before Thanksgiving. It had a, there was a double shadow transit. Um, that and the, and the two shadows flanked the red spot, which I, I couldn't even see the red spot, but the shadows were were very prominent. It was Ganymede and Callisto. That's so show. cool. Yeah. Eat. No, I missed that. Well, I'm sorry I missed that. Yeah. <clears throat> James uh, Webb is ready to ready. Remember, we're doing observing reports, Aria, so don't don't jump ahead. <laughs> we, we have an agenda we're sticking to here, people. <laughs> <laughs> Any yeah. more observing reports, you know, looking with your eyes into the yeah. sky. I saw, been... I saw Orion for the first time this season. <laughs> Last oh, night, yeah. the night before. <laughs> Wasn't much. It's been good seeing some of the really like Arcturus in the morning, right? Leave for work, 
you know, it's I know it's only December, but hey, there's you know hope that spring's coming. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Gus, Gus has been working to, on his uh, the, star uh, puppy. Go ahead. I tried to look for the comet, uh, but didn't see. Two days ago. Uh, my son Gus has been working on his uh, sky puppy, but unfortunately it expires on his birthday uh, in February. Um, so we went out to Richland Park, even though it was slightly cloudy, uh, but with binoculars, we were able to see the Pleiades just fine. And we were able to see uh, Andromeda Galaxy. And after watching the Nova on Andromeda, um, it was a nice viewing, even though it was slightly cl clouded over. There's but a Nova in and Andromeda? There's a Nova. Yeah, yeah. yes. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, That'd be it, huge news. It, when we get to uh, yeah, the next section, if you could move on, please, I could tell you the next part. <laughs> well, see, I, I I I wanted to mention, of course, I, I'm guessing nobody saw the uh, uh, deep partial lunar eclipse, or I'm, I'm clouds. guessing clouds. Yeah, it was it was cloudy. Um, I I. I don't have it handy to share, but I did do a really quick image with uh, the Takahashi. Um, and I discovered, of course, that even one tenth of a second, uh, it really overexposed the uh, lit portion of the moon. The eclipse part looks pretty decent, but I only did a tenth of a second through red, green, and blue filters, uh, you know, one image each. And um, you can go back in our Twitter history and you can see the image on uh, there. I, I just wanted to mention that if, if, if no one saw that. I did share it during the SIG meeting, uh, but I, I but I don't have it handy to share here. And I I was hoping Henry would uh, would have captured images of uh, Comet Leonard going by M3 this morning, but I, I checked the, uh, the cloud uh, account and it doesn't look like he captured any images of it. He must have... Uh, he must have fell asleep and forgot to set his alarm or something. According to the NASA website, they'll be streaming live from Antarctica this morning. And it's the stream is going to come from the J.M. Pasikoff Antarctic Expedition. Oh, there we go. That's not uh, the one I took of the last oh. partial. No. It's, it's on... Um, it's on the Twitter page. It's not on uh, Instagram. Sorry, Pete. Oh. <laughs> okay. I'll be back. I can't tell uh, which mouse is mine. <laughs> I see your cursor, my cursor. It's like I'm moving the mouse around. It's not doing what it's supposed to. That, that, that was that was weird. Um, so, yeah, it's it's not the best image, but it's, uh, it's there. Uh, let's see. Um, astronomical news and events. Becky, what time will they be streaming that today? Oh, yeah. Right. Um, the streaming, I think, starts at uh, 1.30 a.m. Oh, cool. cool. And the totality begins at 2.44 a.m. That's Eastern Standard Time. And the streaming ends at 3.37. Of course, That's the weather good. forecast, I don't think, is very good, so... Oh. Will, there be, will there be a link through NASA's website somehow, maybe? Uh, yeah, you can get on at uh, nasa.gov slash live or on YouTube. Cool. Thank you. That's according to the NASA website. Cool. Thank you, Becky. So, yeah, yep. the, he, here's my images of, uh, image of the uh, partial lunar eclipse with uh, Takahashi on the remote telescope. Oh. Cool. So the color is not right, but but it's not too bad. Is that the fastest exposure you can do? That is mm -hmm. the short, that's the shortest exposure I can do. Yep, tenth of a second. Wow. Yeah, still nice. Looks good. All right. Yeah, so I might try to have to make myself stay up and watch the eclipse if it's clear. <laughs> uh, so astronomical news and events. Arya, did you have something to mention about a certain space telescope? I forgot. Oh, it's, it's, I, I was talking about the James Webb Telescope. Yes. Yeah, the uh, launch was postponed because what happened? Like some cable snapped and they thought it might have jarred the telescope. Yeah. But apparently it all checked out, but they're still going to launch on, what was it, December 22nd now? 22nd, yep. 
Yeah, yep. but unfortunately, it's at seven twenty in the morning. <clears throat> if they do somehow delay into the evening, I'll send out like a flash email to everyone, and we can do like maybe a, a watch party. But let's hope yeah. it actually launches on time on the twenty second, and it doesn't blow up and everything <clears throat> everything goes well. <laughs> See, yeah, I thought it was like it was pretty cool that how long it takes to the fill of fuel. It was like three four days when I fill it up. Yeah, they're kind of going slow. Yeah. Well, they're not rushing either because they've got a really long launch window for this. You know, because what they're essentially doing, they're putting an orbit, a parking orbit. They're going to test everything out, all the components, and then they're going to move it to the L2's location oh. near the side oh. of the moon. And then they go ahead and, and run through all that. So there's not a rush. This this thing doesn't even come online for a couple of months. So yeah. it's, it's not like it's going to be up and running tomorrow when after they or the day after they launch it. So I It'll just think awesome. they're being extra careful. It's not it's like a C5. Hold everything. No, not like, okay, <laughs> not like a C5, which would be better uh, because that's what you want uh, to oh God. There, I got it in. <laughs> nice job, Pete. Nice job. Oh, we've actually gone through a couple of meetings with no C5 freaking references. Bastard. But it's the best <laughs> tool stuff ever. <laughs> so I've heard. Uh, okay. It, it's going to take them almost 30 days to unfold everything and get it ready to ready to go. So it'd be interesting. Yep. I do. I, I, I might send out an email about this. Remember, if you want to learn about the whole James Webb Space Telescope, you can go back to our YouTube channel and listen to our June speaker, uh, Dr. John Mather, who's one of the, you know, like the lead scientist on, on the project, you know, and Nobel Prize winner. That that was our June speaker. So um, I, I, I might review that just to kind of freshen up a bit. Any other astronomical news? I got a software news. Okay, what, what's, what's your software news? Well, uh, for those of you that have iPads, iPhones, Macs, um, uh, Sky Safari Pro 7 just came out. And it's 50% off until the 15th of December. Ah. So if anybody wants to upgrade or thinking of getting the program now's a good time they've got the the plus version is 9.99 right now and the pro version is 24.99 and it will uh drive telescopes and there's a whole bunch of stuff there's a great comparison chart on um their website on what the difference is you get access to a bunch of uh catalogs and everything with the pro version um I got the plus version because it's not going to run a telescope for me here at my house. So, but uh, anybody that might be interested. That's, that's Sky Pro 7. Sky Safari Sky 7. Safari. Sky. Yep, yeah, I, did, I, did up, plus. I did upgrade. And uh, the, yeah, the, the telescope control is supposed to be much improved, but I haven't tried it yet. Because I live in Michigan. One other... Uh, mention about the uh, James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, CNN did a program a couple of Sundays ago called Planet B, that pun intended there, because it not only talked about the construction and the launch, um, but also the search for other habitable planets. They kind of stuck that in as part of that whole program. So I think it was an hour, and it was really very good. But I looked to see if they're going to uh, broadcast it again. So far, I haven't been able to find any references to that. But it was worth the time. And Mather had a big part of it. I mean, he got a lot of screen. Oh, great. Yeah. Hey, Richard, uh, last week, I, I actually did try the Sky Safari with my, my astrophysics, and the, even though it was cloudy out, and use it to, you know, it was actually pretty, pretty nice. That'd be really nice for, like, out at the club observatory for yeah. Uh, public stuff made it real easy to. I'm sure my kids could uh, even figure it out. Well, thanks a lot. <laughs> I, 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 I just never had time to figure it out with uh, version six, but seven is supposed to be a lot easier. So, no, it works I, really. It works really nice. It's a. Yeah. yeah. I love the interface. I mean, well, they make it real easy. Just click, click. But yeah, it's a pretty cool, pretty cool planetarium program overall. Nice to pull in uh, comets and stuff. Yeah. So easy, a uh, Richard Bell could do it. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, just as long as I get money for, for people saying that, that's fine. So Kevin, send me, send me a nickel. <laughs> Any other news? Anybody wanted to share? How about the uh, DART mission? You know, what could go wrong? Boom, hits Earth, and we're all dead. <laughs> Oh, is is that to deflect the uh, asteroid thing? Yeah, yeah. they're they're going to try to knock a little asteroid out of its orbit just to see if, right. see, see if they can do it. And... I hope they don't push it the wrong way. That's what I I, I, I think Armageddon. Armageddon. That's right. <laughs> All Bruce Willis. <laughs> Phil Plate's favorite Rock movie. <laughs> oh my God! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If anyone remembers uh, Phil Plate's visit here in 2009, he just railed about that movie. I, I've purposely never seen it because I knew it was bad before it even came out, so I, I skipped that one. I have to tell you, I watched it for the Sci Science Fiction Film Festival at KMC several years ago, and I literally felt my IQ decreasing in my brain. I could <laughs> feel it. It was like, it's like, you know, if you eat really rich, sweet food, you can feel your arteries hardening. Yeah. I could feel my <laughs> IQ decreasing. It took, it took you know, months of good videos and reading to get it back. <laughs> For those interested, there's actually a British uh, astrophysicist lady who actually reviews sci-fi shows and movies for the scientific aspect of it. It is awesome. It's on YouTube. They're like, she'll like review like Stargate, you name the movie. If there's scientific, she'll look at the scientific accuracy and she'll like slam it hard if it has to be. I mean, it's on YouTube, it's uh, I'll find a link to it, but it's she has a whole ser a whole volume of uh, reviews, um, pretty good. And does she do TV shows? You know, there's a real spate of time warping uh, TV series here lately. When they had when they had um, Armageddon on Sci Fi Channel, they were advertising it, and they actually spelled asteroid wrong. <laughs> they spelled they they said asteroid but not asteroid right. and asteroid is actually a word it's a mathematical term but not only did they do that but when they used a screen capture from one from the movie they flipped it inverted so the met life building said ethel tem <laughs> <laughs> i actually i took a picture of it on my tv i don't have the I don't have that picture on my iPad right now or I'd share it, but it was hilarious. So I sent it to a friend of mine in Hollywood and he knows people that worked at, at uh, Sci-Fi Channel. He said he just, they just like ragged on them so bad. Yeah, I just pasted a link. Um, this is actually, she's reviewing the crashing things and the asteroids, like, but she's kind of reviewing the DART mission, but she also kind of goes into, like you say, TV shows, movies. What is... Dr. Becky. Okay. Anyway, sorry. Okay. Dr. Becky. Dr. Becky. Her so stuff is good. Beauty only for uh, astronomy, huh? All right. It seems we've run out of astronomical news, so let me zip through the rest of the agenda here. I just wanted to mention some upcoming events. We have um, online viewing session tomorrow, um, but I... I might have to uh, whoop, let me mute Kevin here. He's watching the video already, I think. So, so we have an online viewing session scheduled for tomorrow, but the forecast uh, that I'm looking at for at least Rodeo, New Mexico, because they don't have anything for Portal anymore, uh, says it might be a little cloudy early in, early in the evening when we actually do the session, but clear up after we get done. So we might have to postpone till Sunday, but I, I will send out a, a notification about that. So I, I just posted a registration link in the chat for tomorrow's session if you haven't registered already. And is we that, do have, yeah. Is that open to the public? It is. They, they're all open to the public, every one of them. Uh, we have a Observing SIG session at Richland Township Park on Saturday, December 11th at 7.30 p.m. Uh, from the way the weather looks, the parking lot uh, should be safe to drive in, Aaron. So I think you'll, you guys will be good to go and nobody will fall and break a hip or anything it was solid slushy nasty gushy awesomeness when we were up there a couple days ago so yeah. hopefully that clears up yep i think we'll be good and then we have our last event of the year um, unless we do a impromptu web uh party we have an astrophotography sig meeting 
uh, on Zoom, unfortunately, on Friday, December 17th at 8 o'clock. Uh, Pete, you want to give us a preview? Yeah, um, I'm going to be going over um, uh, imaging automation. Uh, the software package is called Sequence Generator Pro. Uh, it's a pretty uh, popular package out there. I'm going to cover like what it takes to actually get it so you can actually start up and let the telescope collect images all night long doing autofocusing, go to an object, you know, plate solve, auto, you know, center it up for you or go from object to object. So I'm just going to cover the basics of what you need to do to get the software configured to go do it all for you. You can sit there and watch it. I'll do that. Or if you want to go from night to night, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but it's going to be a hopefully a, a informative uh, discussion. There's a lot of little pitfalls that people um, get tripped up on with the software, whether it's uh, interfacing it with the auto guider software, PhD2, or how to get the auto focuser working, blah, 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 all that stuff. Great. Thanks, Pete. Yep. And don't forget to publish uh, something about it on the uh, Sequence Generator Pro website, uh, you know, on the forum. So oh, maybe, yeah, we, maybe right. we get some people yep. here. Yeah. Um, prime focus. Uh, of course, I'll, I'll just mention the usual deadline is the 15th of every month. Uh, but with the January issue, I was going to, you know, maybe make some cosmetic changes. You know, the newsletters pretty much look the same since roughly uh, late 2005. Um, you know, I'm, I always welcome input, of course, but, uh, you know, I, I'm not really sure what to do with the cover yet. It might more or less stay the same. I, I don't know. Uh, but for like the body, you know, the inside of the newsletter, I'm probably going to get rid of the justified paragraphs because I think, you know, usually the unjustified versions are easier to read. I don't know if you guys agree with that or not, but um, I figured I would make it more like, you know, the professional magazines. They're not usually justified. They're unjustified. Um, I, I'm not going to worry about margins anymore. You know, for those that those people that print the newsletter, you can reduce the uh, size of the page to, to fit your printer margins. So uh, I'm going to be a lot looser with uh, the margins in the future. And, um, you know, just make a few, again, just a few basic cosmetic changes. But, you know, if, if anyone had any uh, ideas or, you know, uh, thoughts or things you'd like to see different, just, you know, drop me an email. I'm I'll always welcome input. Um, moving on, other things. Um, I don't know if, you know, um, I always say no one ever reads the newsletter. Uh, and now I got the proof to back it up. Uh, first, did you guys like the new emails that I've been sending out through MailChimp with the fancy HTML and the pictures and stuff like that? I thought it looks more professional. So, so I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I haven't seen um, those. <clears throat> you got the open rates, don't you? Yeah, I have the open rates. And uh, the last time I looked, you know, I, I sent out 294 uh, versions of that email. And the last time I looked at the uh, results, uh, 98 people actually clicked on the newsletter link. So that hurts, you know, that, that really, really hurts that a lot of people just aren't looking at the newsletter that I take, you know, so much time to put together. So that might affect the redesign too. It might be a bit smaller here in the future because- I'm one of those who clicked on it. Don't shake your head at okay. me. I, I, I had it here in my hot little hand. I'm sure everyone here read I it, but- on it. It's, it's those we- people that we just never get to see, unfortunately. They, they need to look at it. It's in my uh, hand, Richard, right here. I see it. I, I think see maybe it. Mike, Mike Sinclair needs to uh, get his car revved up, maybe. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> run right. Jack over. I agree. Just go ahead and run oh, Jack over, Rich, Mike. That's fine. Rich, just send me the list. <laughs> is that his Jeep with a cow catcher on it? I, know. I was right. say, he needs a cow catcher. <laughs> okay, so... um. Other the, the other thing I want to mention with the newsletter is I don't know if anyone read my column on gift ideas. Of course, there's the and I'll just kind of rehash it real fast. There, there's the Sky Shop. There's our clothing store. Uh, of course, you can uh, buy through a uh, uh, use the link uh, from Orion through our website, and we get a commission. But remember, there's Amazon Smile. But I wanted to share with you uh, a couple of things I got on Amazon recently. As uh, number one, I got a new telescope. Well, sort of. Let me make myself, um, let, let me uh, highlight myself here so, so I can make this bigger. So here's my new telescope. So you can see it's uh, this little uh, uh, plastic uh, telescope, 
you know, kind of a flat two-dimensional telescope. There we go. Nice so, family. And, and it has this cool little uh, stand. And of course you put it in the stand, it has a USB cord. So if you want to plug it into a regular outlet, you got to get yourself a USB adapter. But of course, you can get those at any dollar store now. And then it has a little power button here. And I don't know how well this will work, but well, of course, it's way over lit. But it looks really better when it's not so bright. I don't know if I can get it further away or a little closer. But uh, this cost me like, you know, all of $8. I don't know if they have different telescopes, but of course, they have all bazillion different versions of these you know like uh disney characters or marvel characters star wars characters of course those are all disney characters now uh but you know here i've got the here. enterprise version of that oh do you cool yeah so they that they, they, they have the enterprise too i keep trying to move it to the right way but yeah it's they got darth vader version of that so of course it's much more detailed than you see in the picture but uh that's that i guess that's the best i can do with zoom where'd you get it richard uh Amazon. Of course, I got it through Amazon Smile. So, so the club got a little uh, contribution. And there's one more thing I ordered on Amazon recently. Just I always wanted to have a copy. And I got it to tease Sinclair with. So Sinclair, this is for you. Oh, God. oh my <laughs> God. All right. I need, I need two things that you need to tell me. First, Eric, what is it rated? What is the rating on it? Uh, PG thirteen. It's but, probably PG. Yeah, it's PG thirteen. There's no nudity in it. Okay, good. And secondly, how much did it cost? Uh, gosh, I think I spent like all the eight dollars on it. I'm buying it for our our sci-fi film fest. Oh, I can loan it to you. I'm trying to. Oh, here it is. PG thirteen. Perfect. Exactly. That's it. All right. So if nice you've never. If you've never seen this, it's like the ultimate 80s B-movie. You know, a, a comet comes by Earth, wipes out life, it turns people in the red dust. But, of course, if you're inside, like, a proper steel container, you survive. And these people have to fight, you know, people that got a slight exposure that are basically zombies. So it, it, it's basically more of a zombie horror movie. But it's really a, a cheesy 80s movie that's a lot of fun. And I, I saw it in the theaters and just thought it was corny but loved it. It's it's good corny. Good corny. Sounds like it, a I, just, I just watched that a few months ago again because I'd seen it before. Yeah. And the, the, one, the older sister was actually also in the movie Last Starfighter. But right. the guy they hook up with is um, Robert Beltran, who played Chakotay. In Star Trek Voyager, oh, I didn't uh, realize yeah. that until I watched the movie. Yep. I was going to say the only bad part of the movie is Robert Beltran because I, I I hated him in Voyager too. So <laughs> <laughs> he he just doesn't do it for me for some reason. I, I just don't like him. <laughs> but the the two main characters are great. They're a lot of fun. So so I so maybe we'll do that for a full moon theater once we ever get to meet in person again. We, we haven't done one of those in a long time. Uh, so does anybody else have anything else uh, fun or crazy or serious to share? Jack. Mike, for Mike, uh, my son found a clapper that turns the lights on and off. Darth Vader. And, and when you clap it to turn it off, it says, the force is stronger than you believe on the dark side. And you're sitting there with the lights off. That's definitely something I probably need. I need a lot of things, but that's I'm, definitely on my list. I found it at Walgreens, <laughs> on a, like a clearance shelf or something. I don't, oh, he geez. said there was only one, but he had to grab it. He, oh, yeah. With it. <laughs> Anything that has Darth Vader, well, that just does it for me. So, um, hey, Muhammad. I believe it is a movie by name Omicron that was uh, from 1963. It's about aliens that come in uh, to your earth. And then um, I guess they take over the race. Sounds like your typical uh, alien movie. <laughs> Don't pronounce it Omicron, though. Omicron, yeah. Yeah. If anybody hasn't seen it, seen it the live action Cowboy Bebop on Netflix is pretty good. It's a, kind of a 70s film noir. Uh, thing, but they, they spent a lot of time set traveling between like Ganymede and Europa and Mars. Um, there's, you know, the, the famous Ganymede endangered right. sea rats. Um, 
but they do a good job of uh, world building and um, character building. Yeah, kind of like the Expanse. No, that was, that was a great series. Um, I don't know if they're even going to make another season. They kind of leaned into not having it, not finishing it up, but who knows? So I don't know. Looking forward to seeing part two of Dune. That's all I'm waiting for. <laughs> All right, we'll skip uh, election results because uh, we'll have to wait for that. And then, of course, as mentioned, uh, the January meeting, we'll have Dr. David Williams, who's from uh, Arizona State University, Tempe, and a co-investigator of the Psyche Mission. He'll be talking about the Psyche Mission, Psyche Journey to a Metal World. So our first visit to an M-type asteroid is supposed to launch, uh, I think, late this winter or at least early spring. So it'll be uh, uh, breaking uh, news here uh, come January. So um of course, you can get on the website now and register for that now, but I'll, I'll definitely give you registration links uh, um, quite a bit in the weeks ahead. So without further ado, we will go ahead and officially adjourn the meeting. So uh, thanks for joining us.